This year, I've decided to do two things. Number one, become what they call a Cubestronaut, which is achieved by passing all five Kubernetes certifications. And two, finally build out a home lab. I've been plagued in the past with low internet speeds, and now that things have picked up, I'm finally piecing things together. And you can rightly assume that this home lab includes running my own Kubernetes cluster so that I can get hands-on practice for these certifications. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you what I'm running so far from the ground up, how I set up my domain, certificates, DNS, monitoring in Kubernetes, as well as the reasons you should consider having some sort of server, servers, network, or whatever in your house that you have to manage. Even in this short time that I've had so far with my setup, I've either learned or been refreshed on so many important concepts in this field, from Linux administration to networking, TLS, storage, security, to really getting hands-on with these Kubernetes concepts I'm learning for the exams. It's a place for you to mess up, break things, and learn to fix it. That's real learning. So if you're considering a Kubernetes certification this year, want to learn more about the subject, or simply just want to get a Linux server running in your home on a Raspberry Pi, then be sure to give this a watch. Let's get started. So I'll try and diagram this for you along the way. First, I have Starlink for my internet. The router they give you is super basic and limited, but it's okay, it'll work. Second, I already had an old Raspberry Pi 4 running Pi-hole as my DNS server. If you're considering your first move into running a private home network, this is a great first step setting Pi-hole as your DNS server. For me, this means in my Starlink app, I'm gonna set the custom DNS to be the IP address of my Pi-hole server. Thus, every device on my network will send its DNS queries to Pi-hole. And then Pi-hole allows me to block ads and trackers, to blacklist domains, to set local DNS records, which we'll see the significance of soon, and can even act as a DHPC server if needed to assign IP addresses. And by the way, how to set up Pi-hole, how to install Kubernetes via kubeadm, and all the app deployments, TLS setup, etc. I'm about to talk about is going to be explained much more in the home lab course I'm currently creating in the Travis Media community. So if you want to go deeper or ask me questions or get help in any way with any of those topics discussed in this video, consider checking out the Travis Media community. There will be a link below. Next, I wanted primarily a Kubernetes cluster running all the things outside of Pi-hole. I had a Raspberry Pi 5 8 gigs of RAM model already, so I ordered a second one, but the 16 GB version. This gives me a two node cluster, one master, one work. But as we all know, they run with these SD cards that aren't overly reliable or fast. So I added a couple of things to both of these Pi 5s. First, a PoE or Power Over Ethernet hat with high speed NVMe SSD support. This is the secret sauce. It does two things. Number one, you don't need a power cable anymore. It's powered by ethernet. And I have a cheap five port switch that supports PoE, so they'll be plugged into that. And I'll put a link to all these things below for those interested. And two, you can attach a PCIe SSD to this hat. This gives you much better speeds and better reliability. Goodbye SD card, welcome SSD drive. This PoE NVMe hat can be picked up for around 37 bucks on Amazon. So two of these. And for the drive itself, the SSD was about 19 bucks for 256 gigabytes, so two of these as well. Now, just to note, there are some other options out there that may be cheaper and better suited for you. There's this B-Link mini PC, 16 GB RAM, 500 GB SSD, 469 bucks with a nice case. There's also the GMK Tech mini PC with some slightly smaller specs for 139. So there are other options, but since I already had a Pi 5, I decided just to go with another one. And then finally, I picked up a cheap cluster case to keep them together and to be a bit more organized. Organized. And if I add another node down the road, this case accommodates two more. So that's the hardware. No big racks, no expensive firewalls to buy or closets to occupy. Just this much to start. And it's enough. In fact, you don't really even need to buy anything. You may have some old or unused computers lying around that will act as servers that you can use. The point is that you, by having to maintain these machines, will learn real industry transferable concepts that will make you a much better IT professional. Now, before we move to the Kubernetes install, domain setup, certificates, software, and all of that, let's hear briefly about another way to pick up technical industry transferable concepts with today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant.org is a great way to learn math, logic, and computer science interactively. Brilliant's fun, practical, and has thousands of lessons from computer science and programming, algorithms, Python, 
Python, data, logic, and other tools to help you level up. And it's built for busy people like me and you. You can master big concepts in as little as 15 minutes a day, and it's a much better use of your time than mindless scrolling. Maybe you want to dive deeper into large language models, big data, or just learning the basics of Python and their programming in CS course. Today, I started the linear algebra course, beginning with an overview of vectors, working through moving things between specific points on a board. Brilliant helps you build your critical skills through problem solving, not memorizing. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also, in the process, become a better thinker overall. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Travis Media or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now back to the video. Next, I don't want to be having to keep up with IP addresses as I begin to install apps. And with Pi-hole, they have a local DNS feature to map an IP address to a domain, a fictitious domain, whatever you can think up really. That's fine, but we want to learn here. We want to do things properly. Thus, I wanted to implement TLS in my home network to ensure secure and encrypted applications. At the same time, I don't want my home network exposed at all to the public internet. Here's how I did that. First, I bought a domain name. Maybe you have one already, maybe you want to pick one up. I created a new one on Cloudflare for like nine bucks called travismedia.cloud. Then it would seem the next step is to add an A record to your home public IP. Again, I don't want to expose my home network, and you don't need an A record at all. In fact, Let's Encrypt has something called a DNS01 challenge that lets you just confirm ownership of a domain via a text record. So you can actually use this challenge for domain names whose web servers aren't exposed to the public internet. And when I need to request a certificate, Let's Encrypt will query the DNS system for that record. If it finds a match, meaning I own the domain, then it can issue one. It doesn't matter that it runs in a private network. Now I can have grafana.travismedia.cloud or dashboard.travismedia.cloud with real TLS in a completely private network. And I'm going to manage all the certificate stuff with Cert Manager deployed in Kubernetes, which we'll turn to now. So let's talk about the Kubernetes setup. Many suggest installing K3S as it's lightweight and it runs great on these Pi clusters. Well, it does, and I initially did that, but I soon pulled out of it. The reason is that K3S has a different architecture and structure than what you'll find in a Kube ADM installation and with what you'll find on the Kubernetes certifications. For instance, the manifest files with K3S are in a different location. Get used to that and you'll get confused on the timed exam trying to find them. I wanted my environment to run the traditional Kube ADM installation, so that's what I went with. Also, it's really good practice setting this up. You'll learn a lot. So how do you create a Kubernetes cluster with kubeadm? Well, the documentation is pretty great on this. I had no trouble with it, except on one part. In the latest version, they took out the part about enabling IPv4 packet forwarding. They did this because some cluster networking solutions do this for you, and since it can differ, it shouldn't belong in this documentation, but more for you to consult the cluster networking solutions documentation. At least that's what I got out of reading the GitHub issue on it. But anyway, Check out an older version of Kubernetes and find this section and be sure to apply it. Otherwise, your cluster won't work properly. Or you can simply just install a version or two back from the current and use it to practice upgrading your cluster, which will be 100% on the exam. But when I follow these type of instructions, I often like to see someone else do it as well. There's one very helpful YouTube video that I watched to be sure I was also following the right steps. I'll link it below for you. So now I have a Kubernetes cluster running on two Raspberry Pis and I'm ready to start using it. And this is where things really get interesting in regards to the CKA exam and anyone looking to take it. Once you start installing apps here, you'll have a number of things happen. Number one, you'll begin to use kubectl commands over and over for logs and describing resources and troubleshooting and configuring YAML and editing. Number two, you'll begin to think about labels and selectors, namespaces, logging and monitoring solutions. And number three, you'll start to deploy apps via manifests or Helm. You'll start dealing with persistent volumes and claims, editing YAML configurations, dealing with resource requests. And these are all things you're learning in theory only in your certification prep course, but becomes reality now that you're managing it all. This isn't a cloud cluster. You are managing everything here and you will run into issues and things will break and you'll have to troubleshoot, and in doing so, you'll slowly become a real Kubernetes administrator. This is the way. This is how you learn the real tactics that put you above the rest. And at this point in time, I've only deployed four apps so far. 
The first one is Cert Manager. This will issue certificates for each application that I'm running. I installed it via the Helm chart, then created a cluster issuer that will issue certificates. And this is where I would configure the DNS01 challenge via an API token from Cloudflare. So after launching this and having it add a TXT record we talked about earlier, thus verifying that I own the domain, when I need a certificate created for a new subdomain, I simply just create a certificate object or resource, and the issuer will do all the work in issuing the certificate via Let's Encrypt for my domain and adding it to my Kubernetes secrets. That's amazing. But my apps are on all these different ports. So I need a reverse proxy like Nginx, or in my case, I chose traffic for this routing. With traffic, I can create ingress routes for my apps and specify the TLS certificate that Cert Manager issued for the desired subdomain and port. Then I can visit something like Grafana, which is on port 3000, and hey, I'm secure. And then finally, I deployed Prometheus and Grafana. These are simple deployments via Helm, but do require persistent volumes created ahead of it. Prometheus will scrape data, and Grafana will display it in nice looking dashboards. So that's where I'm at currently, and it's all running on my Kubernetes cluster on two Raspberry Pis. I'll be running this throughout the year as I work through studying for the Kubernetes certs and using them for practice and hands-on experience. Again, if you want more detail or you want to ask questions or even just join a great community of professionals, do check out the Travis Media community. And if you're doing something similar this year, let me know down in the comments. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, consider doing so, and I'll see you in the next video.